Hey, everybody, and welcome to Collider Movie Talk, movie talk for movie fans. I'm your host, Ashley Mova, and this is The Daily Show, where we give you all of the latest news from the world of movies, plus a little bit of insight into what it all means. Joining us, as always, is is John Campia. <laughs> yeah. 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 Greetings and salutations, everybody. Welcome to the best damn movie related show on the planet Earth, coming to you from right here at the Collider Video Headquarters here in Burbank, California. More on that in a bit, and we are so excited to be a part of your day. Also, here is writer director John Schnepp. Everything's green. <laughs> Everything's green on Monday at Collider Movie Talk. <laughs> also, here is Collider's Mark Ellis. I'd like to thank the Boston Celtics for this paint job and if Tyrese and Chris Pine want to come out and say they're going to be the Green Lantern, this is the week to do it, boys. Right. Uh, hey, listen guys, for those of you who are not already apprised and abreast of what's going on, this is the, the first uh, episode of Collider Movie Talk. Um, quick, the, the Coles Notes version of it, mm -hmm. as many of you know, I resigned from AMC about a month ago and then uh, upon trying to look for what I was going to do next, I decided that despite some really great offers that I had from other places, I was going to do my own thing. But then I got a call from my buddy Steve Weintraub at Collider. Says, you need to talk to the guys at Complex. So I did. The fit was instantaneous. It was great. And I decided I was going to join. And then from then... Uh, in talking with my friends at AMC, some of the executives there, this idea got birthed about um, AMC Movie News shutting down and AMC becoming a sponsor of Collider Video, allowing uh, me to bring the team and uh, keep the band together, bring the shows that the fans have wanted to see and continue on. And we are, so, I, I speak on behalf of everybody here, we are so excited now to be a part of the Collider and the Complex community. Um, we're just so stoked to be here, so stoked to be with you guys, and we are ready to get rolling on the first guaranteed error-filled episode <laughs> of Collider Movie Talk. So let's get rolling. All right, it's Monday, so it's time for the weekend box office report, brought to you by AMC Theaters. Coming in at the number one spot for the fourth week in a row was Jurassic World, taking in $30.9 million. Jurassic World becomes the fastest film in history to hit the $550 million domestic mark in just 24 days and has also become the fifth highest grossing film worldwide of all time. In the number two spot for the third weekend in a row is the Pixar film Inside Out, bringing in $30.1 million for a $246 million domestic total in just three weeks. It also became the highest grossing film in history to never be at number one at the box office, beating out 2002's My Big Fat Greek Wedding at $241 million. In third spot is Terminator Genesis, making, making $28.7 million. In the number four spot is Magic Mike XXL, bringing in $11.6 million. And rounding out the top five is Ted 2, making $11 million. John, what stands out to you about this week's box office report? Uh, some of you I should point out on the graphic it said Jurassic World 43 point something that was actually the long weekend total the actual weekend total proper was 30.9 million um, this is uh, an interesting weekend because there's a couple of really continuous big pleasant surprises and a couple of disappointments obviously it all starts with Jurassic World at this point look even after the opening weekend which nobody saw coming nobody saw that opening weekend coming even those of us who saw then saw the numbers, we thought, okay, well, it's not going to last. It's a good movie. It's a fun movie. It's a movie I enjoyed, but it's not a movie I was loving out of my mind and thought, I'm going to line up and see this three or four times in a row like I did with the original Avengers. And so I thought, you know, it's not going to do have those types of legs. Four weeks later, still <laughs> at number one, it just keeps rolling. Very impressive numbers, and I, I just, I've given up predicting when it's going to stop. You guys just don't know. As far as Inside Out goes, my favorite movie of the year so far, I honestly thought that that record by my big fat Greek wedding, biggest box office in history, having never actually been number one, I that was one of those records that I thought would never be beaten. I thought you just, you cannot make north of 240 million in the domestic box office and never be number one. And the special combination of Inside Out with Jurassic World, and we've seen that come to fruition, obviously disappointing results for Terminator Genesis. Obviously disappointing results for Magic Mike XXL. I think a lot of people thought, and I believe I saw a number that said 92%. It might have actually been 94, but I'll go more conservative, say 92. Of the audience that went to go see the movie were actually female. 92%. <laughs> That's unheard of. That's I don't think 
uh, Sex in the City have those kinds of numbers. So a little bit disappointing there, but overall, man, it's just it continues to be a Jurassic World. Anyway, Schnepp, anything stands out to you about the box office? People keep wanting to see dinosaurs. I mean, that's <laughs> the, the most amazing thing to me is, uh, I mean, even with all the criticism of Jurassic World and people like, you know, pointing out, you know, plot holes and some story problems and this and that, people are seeing this movie in droves yeah, and, and droves and droves. And like anyone I talk to, even if they're like, yeah, I didn't really like it, but you saw it. Yeah, I totally had to see it. Yeah, it's like one of those <laughs> things where I haven't even gotten a chance yet to see Terminator Gen Genesis is how you say it, right? Yeah. Terminator uh, Sega Genesis. Sega Genesis. <laughs> um, I don't want to say that from now on. I'm just <laughs> taking that. Um, I still want to see it, even though it's, it didn't get you know the greatest reviews, but I'm still psyched to see that movie. I'm disappointed that you know, that it got bad, you know, not that good reviews and that the public didn't go out to see it. But I'm still I still have like my sights really high to see that film. So, Mark. yeah, I mean, look, this is all about the 4th of July and what families want to go see. And I think that families proved we want a really fun theater experience like Jurassic World that the whole family can enjoy mm -hmm. or Inside Out, which is great for kids and adults on different levels. Magic Mike XXL and Terminator Jenny Smith prove <laughs> how marginalized they can be. I mean, look, you, you had these great franchises. How long have you been waiting for that one? <laughs> I've been sitting on that one for a few weeks now. Thanks for watching. I mean, it's just, it, 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 it's not, it's disappointing, but it's not unexpected, especially when you actually see those films. They're not the quality of Jurassic World or Inside Out. And I could argue, and I have argued, that Inside Out is the best film of the year. Jurassic World might be the most satisfying theater experience. I think it's right up there with Avengers Age of Ultron at Mad Max Fury Road. And for Inside Out to do what it's doing, my big fat Greek wedding, look out. There's a new Scotty Pippen in town, and its name is Inside Out. To so never quite be number one, to be that much of a monster at the box office. It's it's a great time for movies. It's a bummer for Terminator because the, it, I didn't like the movie, and I don't think it deserved to make more than it did, but I love Arnold. He was great in Terminator Genesis, and to see this franchise going south like this, I don't think it's going to recover until you can maybe get the rights back to James Cameron in a couple years. Well, I think you nailed Nailed it. What with saying is, it's the family films that really, for July Fourth weekend, you have Jurassic World and you have Inside Out, and none of the other films, even in those top five, are, are family related films. So they can't possibly be one or two. You know, it is. You mentioned the whole Arnold thing too, and I am one of those very rare creatures that actually didn't mind Terminator. Sega Genesis. I actually did not. I, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying, man, I really love that movie. No, but I, I didn't hate it. I'm one of the few people who didn't. It is unfortunate because I honestly don't think Arnold has ever been better than when he started coming back. His look, seriously, his performances in The Last Stand, mm -hmm. Maggie, um, he wasn't even that bad in that Sylvester Stallone Escape movie. Plan. Escape Plan. And I thought uh, he's never been better in a Terminator movie than he was here. But that doesn't necessarily mean that the uh, material was right or that the material worked. But I think it's really unfortunate that Arnold has never been better, but obviously he's not the draw anymore. And that's that's kind of an unfortunate thing. That's right. And Ted too. Also, it, I think that it, if people wanted to go see an R-rated film, that Ted too is going to take some of the the yeah. heat away from Terminator Magic Mike as well. Good point. All right, what's next? A few days ago, images appeared online of the upcoming issue of Entertainment Weekly featuring the trio of Batman, Superman, and Wonder Woman on the cover. Inside the issue, Ben Affleck speaks about his version of Batman saying the following. He's at the end of his run and maybe the end of his life. There's this sort of world weariness to it. He's on the verge of being swallowed up by the anger and the rage that we see haunt this character and the other manifestations of it. But this guy is further down the line and has become more embittered and cynical. Mark what do you make of this image and Affleck's comments? I think the, the, the image is awesome and the comments are even better. I didn't love the Entertainment Weekly cover to this. It felt like Henry Cavill was the only superhero on the cover. The other two, Wonder Woman and Batman, looked like the cosplay ones that I'm going to see later this week at Comic-Con. However, the quotes from Affleck is exactly what I want to hear because we've never seen, we've heard about this Batman, we've read about him in comic books and graphic novels, we've never seen him on the big screen. We've always seen Batman go through something treacherous and then, oh man, I don't know if I can do this anymore. Now to see that Batman that is completely broken and swallowed by rage and now has this new threat, such a bitter dude, I am, my, this is what I was expecting to hear, but I didn't know that I'd be this excited about it this early. March needs to get here soon. Yeah, I'm, I'm completely with you on, especially the cover 
of the magazine. I thought the cover of the magazine was just three images of things that we haven't not seen already. You know, it was. I haven't seen Batman that chubby. <laughs> <laughs> I I just you know it was okay. It was there, so it's cool to see that it's on the cover. I'm dying with anticipation to see the film. That being said, the comments from Affleck are bang on. They're absolutely here's the, here's the thing. A couple of decades ago, and Schnepp can speak more to this than I can really, but a couple of decades ago, there was a shift in the Batman character in the comic books. He became a character who truly was, he was skin that was just containing a, a, a boiling eruption of rage and anger that comes from the moment of seeing his parents killed in that alley. To the point now that he unleashes that rage and anger now in a controlled way, on those who would prey upon the innocent in Gotham City. In essence, any criminal in Gotham has to pay the price for the people who killed his mother and father. That's Batman. We started to get a little, we did get a glimpse of that Batman in the Christopher Nolan Christian Bale Batman, but we have never really truly seen it embodied. And what I love about these comments from Ben Affleck and the fact that he is such a lifelong Batman nerd mm -hmm. is that you knew he was going to bring that. He wanted that element of it. When Zack Snyder started talking about you know, uh, The Dark Knight Returns being such a heavy influence, you knew we were going to get a glimpse of that rage-infused Batman. And in that trailer, man, when you hear Jeremy Irons talking about uh, it be he becomes cruelty or whatever, and that there's a close-up on Affleck's face, if you watch it close, man, I love that trailer because when you watch those frames closely, Affleck's face is shaking. You just feel the rage coming off it. And to see that Batman... Now, that doesn't mean that this Batman is going to be better than Christian Bale's Batman. Not, not, not at all. But I do think we are going to get this element of Batman that Bale's Batman didn't give us. And I am very excited about that. Whether they use it right or wrong, we're going to have to wait and see. But just the fact that they seem to be zoning in on that, super stoked. Anyway, Schnapp. I actually think this Batman is going to be the best Batman. I think it's going to beat all of the other Batmans because it's based on what you said, the original newer take of Batman, this rage-filled Batman who is personified in Frank Miller's The Dark Knight Returns. And that's what the first Tim Burton Batman took it, its uh, first take from. That's what Nolan took his take from. And that is definitely what Zack Snyder and Ben Affleck are taking their take, most specifically from that. You know, they've been on record saying we're taking elements and scenes from The Dark Knight Returns and that Batman is our Batman. No other Batman movie has said that. They said, oh, we've been influenced, this or that. They're on record for saying that Batman is this Batman. So that's what is very exciting to me because that is the best Batman. And as a kid reading that and growing up watching the Adam West Batman and always wanting a darker Batman just it felt like man it should it shouldn't just be all clownish and like you know I don't know why he's in outer space you know it doesn't make sense they just took it there with uh, Frank Miller's Batman and that's what I that's what I'm looking forward to and, and hearing that Ben Affleck is possibly going to direct the Batman is very <laughs> exciting news hearing that you know the, so one of his buildings went down when Superman was fighting Zod and that's why he's taking he's going after the Man of Steel because you just murdered a whole bunch of my basically my employees and my family, you know, so it's personal. That's what is very exciting to me about it. What's really interesting is how are they going to market this Batman? Because you can't really do it the way that other Batmans have been marketed in, in the past, particularly the Michael Keatons or the Val Kilmers or the George Clooney's, because it's such a different dude. It's such a darker story than you ever got before with Batman. I'm sure that you're going to get that Batman feel and that parents are going to want to take their kids to see it. But just besides all us comic book nerds really getting excited about this movie, you just wonder how. How they're going to market it to a broader audience. I'm sure they'll be able to pull it off fantastic, but it's going to be a different Batman that you see than you've ever gotten before, even just from the trailers and the commercials and whatever fast food tie-in they have. <laughs> yeah, and you know, and despite my enthusiasm for this and how much I'm excited for it and how much I love these comments, I am certainly not saying this movie is going to be great. I, I mean, we just don't know. It is very possible they may take aim and miss the target. But damn it, if they're not at least aiming for the right target. And that part is at least <laughs> worth being excited. All right, folks, reach that part of the show for buy and sell. Here's how this works. In front of her, Ashley's got a few other items in the world of movie news. She's going to run them down. And those of us at the table are simply going to say whether we buy it or sell it. So, Ashley, what do we got? 
As many of you know, Marvel Studios was in talks with Selma director Ava DuVernay to possibly direct their upcoming film, Black Panther. However, those talks have ended and DuVernay will not be helming the project. She said the following, I'm not signing on to direct Black Panther. I think I'll just say we had different ideas about what the story would be. Marvel has a certain way of doing things and I think they're fantastic and a lot of people love what they do. I love that they reach out to me. I love meeting Chadwick and writers and all the Marvel execs. In the end, it comes down to story and perspective, and we just didn't see eye to eye. Jeanette Byersell DuVernay not directing Black Panther. I totally buy it, and I, you just have to respect uh, the decision to not work together. I mean, I, as we've seen before with Edgar Wright leaving, and we've seen you know Thor replacing directors, it happens all the time, and Marvel has a certain aesthetic and a certain way they want to make things, and it's not to say that each director doesn't isn't able to infuse their flavor and their personality and the way that they direct things. Look at James Gunn and Guardians of the Galaxy. That's a perfect example of being able to take something that... Uh, uh, the style of James Gunn and applying it to the Marvel universe. It's not Slither. It's not super, but it is James Gunn's flavor, yeah. but it's inside wrapped around the Marvel universe and other directors just come on with a very strong personality and a very strong, you know, style of their own, which has to uh, be implemented and bend into Marvel's style, so to speak. It's the ho the house style, so to speak. So I'm happy to hear that she's not going to, you know, say, yeah, I'll do it. And then later, you know, quit or be fired or whatever. It just if you can't come to, to where you want to take the character and the story right off the bat, it's better to just say, look, we're, we tried. It didn't work out. So I totally buy that she's leaving and it sounds great. I, I love the character of the Black Panther and I think they'll find someone perfect to direct it. I was very excited when I heard that that Ava was in, in talks for it because to me it was like, hey, they're going out for really quality directors. A lot of times people ask me, hey, who should direct this movie or this movie? And I usually just say, a good director. Just pick a good director. And you know, and in this, they picked a really good director. But I also buy this completely because you know, coming up with these matches is not just about getting a great director. It's about getting a really good fit. Somebody where their vision for the movie is a great fit for what the studio's vision for the movie is because then they can move together in the same direction and go. And I have never been a subscriber to this whole theory that, oh, it can only be this person of a director. Remember, we just came off of, you know, all the drama with Ant-Man and Edgar Wright. And so many people wanted to jump off, you know, that whole ship and saying, oh, well, if Edgar Wright's not directing it, Ant-Man is doomed. They got who? This Peyton Reed guy? Guess what? I've seen Ant-Man. I've seen it twice. It's really damn good. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm not saying it would have maybe even been better with Edgar Wright or not, but what we saw there is the power of a talented director with a studio, when both of their visions are in alignment and they go in the same direction, magic can happen. And full kudos to Ava, who, say, who had the opportunity to direct a big blockbuster and thought, you know what? I see this not working. So instead of just jumping on it anyway and create misery for the studio and misery for myself and end up with a product that doesn't really satisfy the fans, best now to step away, as opposed to a lot of these other movies where we see where they say, yes, we've announced our director, and then three months later, oh, they're off the project now. Full kudos to both Marvel, to Ava for doing this, and I think you know good things are still ahead for Black Panther despite losing Ava. So it's unfortunate, but for me, it's a buy. Yeah, as will happen on the show from time to time, I'm going to regurgitate their thoughts less intelligently. <laughs> I also buy this. Now, Mark L was really the audience member, really wanted to buy a ticket to see mm -hmm, Ava DuVernay's mm -hmm. Black Panther. So that's disappointing for me personally. But for her as an artist, I think this is awesome because she could have paid her mortgage for the rest of her life wherever she wanted to live if she did a big movie like this. She looked at the material, she looked at what Marvel was presenting her, and she said, I'm good. And I think that's awesome. That is such an artist mode to do that. It's it's awesome to see somebody have the strength to say, I'm not going to bend to their will. But then you go to the other side and you say, Marvel, they're doing everything right so far. So they presented her with their master plan. And if she didn't want to fit into it, they're like, that's cool. We know where we're taking this. Right. And so I don't think that Black Panther's in trouble. I don't think DuVernay's in trouble. They just didn't work together. It's OK for people to not see eye to eye on something creatively. So she's going to do a lot of great things in the future. I'm still pumped about Black Panther. Uh, this is this is still good news. All right, what's next? The Hollywood Reporter is reporting that acclaimed director Paul Thomas Anderson, who has directed such films as Boogie Nights, Magnolia, and There Will Be Blood, has signed on to write and most likely direct the upcoming Robert Downey Jr. film Pinocchio, in which Downey will play Geppetto. The film will be based on the classic 1883 story of a woodmaker who carves a puppet that is magically brought to life and wishes to become a real boy. John Byersell, Paul Thomas Anderson, writing and possibly directing Pinocchio. Yeah, surprisingly. 
recently. I'm surprised by how much I buy this. <laughs> this is such a classic story, you know? And despite the fact and the very well-meaning intentions of um, Roberto um, Benigni, Roberto Benigni who made one of my all-time favorite films in Life is Beautiful, he, his follow-up film was then his version of Pinocchio, which was so monumentally bad. This is such a great classic story that I would love to see a live-action version of. I think Robert Downey Jr. playing Geppetto is inspired. I think that's great. And then when you think you think of this movie and they go, who would direct? You would never think Paul Thomas Anderson. But then you hear Paul Thomas Anderson, you go, are you kidding me? Yeah, for me, it's a huge buy. Schnapp. Yeah, the fantastic Mr. Fox, that yeah. Paul Thomas Anderson, I could totally see his amazing style fitting with a new version of Pinocchio. When I heard this, I was like, wow, I hope this happens. You know, I just hope uh, Pinocchio doesn't turn into Ultron and be like, you got no strings. <laughs> you know, like some creepy, we've managed to fit in the Avengers into the brand new Pinocchio. Also he produced by Guillermo del Toro. Yeah. <laughs> he becomes like a horror. Yeah. Yeah. He turns into Iron Man. It's like, uh, um, anyway, that wouldn't happen. I was a woodworker. I made this yeah. one out of metal yeah. from Thor's shield. Yeah. So. Just found Cash it out shield. in the woods next to these magical foxes. <laughs> kind of weird. Um, yeah, I buy it. I would love to see this happen. I certainly hope it does happen. And Anderson will add so much beautiful styling to this Pinocchio story. Yeah, this is weird that I'm going to buy it. Like, I'm not, I, I acknowledge what a great director Paul Thomas Anderson is. His movies to me just, I, I get a little bored watching some of them, but he does get great performances from those films. So for some reason, I'm buying this. And I don't really know why. I can't put my finger on it, but it seems like the combination of him with this source material and Robert Downey Jr. is always a huge buy for me that I'm like, yeah, I'm kind of intrigued. It's never going to make my most anticipated of the year list, but a movie about Pinocchio with Paul Thomas Anderson's take on it, writing and directing, it just, I for some reason, I'm like, yeah, I do kind of want to see that. All right, what's next? Over the past number of years, Comic-Con has become one of the most important dates on film fans' calendars. The event takes place this week in San Diego, California. In recent years, speculation has suggested that the event may move out of the area to a bigger city. But according to a tweet from the mayor of San Diego, a new deal has reached that will keep the event in San Diego until at least 2018. Mark, buyers sell Comic-Con remaining in San Diego until 2018. I sell mayors tweeting, first. <laughs> <laughs> you got you got cities to run, guys. Get off the internet. Uh, I I look. I love San Diego. It's one. It is one of my favorite cities to visit and to perform in. The audiences are great. The people are awesome in San Diego. Go Chargers. I just I th this this concerns me, and I'll probably have a much better answer for this in a week when I go to Comic Con and come back because I've been there the last four years, and every year I've been there, it's gotten a little more packed and a little more crowded. There's still a lot of fun to be had, but you are moving. It's bumper to bumper. To cross the street there takes a good 20 minutes, and to get into the convention hall, particularly the reason why you're going to Comic Con is you're a huge comic book fan or you're a huge fan of the films that they inspire. So getting into Hall H is damn near impossible unless you want to sleep all night in line to go the next day, which is doable. You're a huge fan, that's fine. Or you can go to the convention floor, which sometimes it just gets too hard to move around in there. It's an event. It's exciting. I don't know that Comic-Con should have much of a future in San Diego simply because it's getting too huge. Now, if studios continue to do what Marvel did, what, the, what Marvel's films have done, and be like, yeah, we're not going to Comic-Con at all, then maybe it loses its luster a little bit, and so many people, maybe they decide to go to a different comic book convention with their year, but I, I, I worry about San Diego being to contain the increasing number of people that are going to Comic-Con every year. Yeah, I, I, I sell this. I mean, I, I'm going to echo your sentiments, too. I love the town of San Diego, man. I love that town. My wife and I go there several times a year to spend the weekends there. It's one of my favorite places in the world to eat. Uh, I mean, sometimes one of my favorite parts of Comic-Con is just walking around the gas lamp and picking different restaurants every single day and eating there. It's a marvelous, marvelous city. However, as Dennis Zen keeps pointing out, for years, that city has promised an expanded convention center, new construction on facilities, new hotels, blah, blah. Because Comic-Con, forget it. Like, if you're not literally, if you don't book a hotel room in the first 30 seconds, you think I'm joking? I'm yeah. not. You got 30 seconds to book a room or else you're sleeping 10 miles away. Right. I mean, for years they've promised this and every year we go and Dennis and I will look around 
Where's the construction? Where's the new construction? Never happens. I love San Diego, but it's just become too big for it. When you got town cities like Los Angeles, when you got cities like Las Vegas that is built to handle 300,000 people coming into town, no problem. Forget calling a cab in San Diego. You're talking about a 45 minute wait to get a cab. I mean, it's just become just unworkable. So to the, at least it wasn't 2028. So I'm going to buy it. And by the way, this is a good time to remind you guys. Masters of the Web panel, you're going to see these guys on it at Comic-Con. We're going to be on Friday morning at 11.30 in the morning in room 5AB. Make sure you come to that. And then later in the evening on Friday at 6 p.m., the Movie Talk meet and greet. The Movie Talk crew will be there. Make sure you come and find us and see us. We're going to be hanging out in the lobby of the Omni Hotel having some drinks. So come on by and say hi anyway. Yeah, for several hours. I'll be there at 7. So hang out, you know, <laughs> get a couple drinks and buy them early for me because I'll be at booth number 3915. You know, all so, the whole time. Yeah, the whole time. Come by and see and say hi to me and buy one of my Blu rays for the death of Superman Lives. What happened? Shameless plug. Should we stay in San Diego as comic book nerds? And I've been going to the uh, San Diego Comic Con since the late 90s. So I've only missed like two years since then. So diehard nerd, love it. And it's become a little bit unworkable the last two years. And they have been promising, like, oh, we're going to expand. It'll, it's going to get bigger. We're going to get more rooms. I've luckily been able to, like, lock down a place to stay for, like, the last three years. Because just forget. Yeah, you scored. Yeah, just forget. <laughs> What's forget, her name? Yeah. Uh -huh. Forget, forget, uh, getting a, forget getting a hotel. You're right. The 30 seconds, it's, uh, it's just not going to happen. So, so, you know. The, you know that uh, phrase could be used yeah. in so many contexts. That's right. Those first 30 seconds are the most important. <laughs> um, I think that I think I would I would love to see San Diego Comic Con move to Las Vegas, where it could just be this expansive kind of ins insane, like six giant megaplex buildings. If that's not ever going to happen, or if it happens in 2019, at the very least, I hope that the people, the mayor of San Diego, is able to get at least another building built by next year because they're going to need it. Regardless if Marvel pulls out, other people are just going to be like, Marvel's not there? Whew, let's yep. swoop in. Yeah. Because that's a lot of eyeballs. That's a lot of buzz. That's a lot of, that's not going to go away. So. Right, yeah, and, and I brought up the Chargers for a reason. Is that they've been trying to get a new stadium down there forever too, and it, it just hasn't happened yet to the point where they might lose the Chargers to go to L.A., which wow. I don't want to see happen either. Like I love San Diego; I think it's good for the economy. We just you just need to be able to accommodate all these throngs of people that are going to be down there. All right, folks, we reached that part of the show for mailbag. Listen, if you've got a topic or a question you'd like to address on the show, you can email us anytime at Collider Video at gmail.com once again that new email address is collider video which you can see right here at gmail.com send on in your questions and we'll see if we can get yours on the show with that being said ashley what's in the mailbag warren joshua foster writes i've been following you guys daily since last fall and have gone back and watched every episode i've grown very fond of your different shows and really enjoyed getting sweaty with heroes <laughs> my question is with now the sad loss of john campia what will there be <laughs> any new mailbag episodes anymore thanks for putting on a high quality trustworthy show and keep it filthy let me read that last part in the sweaty nerd voice thanks for putting on a very high quality <laughs> i can't finish it <laughs> <laughs> Let me do a sad obituary. <laughs> sad loss of John Campia. <laughs> Tragically died in a painting accident this weekend. <laughs> But man, did he leave us with something? Uh, yep. <laughs> that green was toxic. Here's okay. Uh, here's clearly these questions were taken from the old email address, the uh, AMC Movie Talk at mm -hmm. gmail.com email address. Um, but the the question brings up a great opportunity to point out a couple things. Not only is Collider Movie Talk now here on Collider, but we are bringing over some of our most popular shows as well, which include Heroes is going to be. Uh, here on the channel as well. We're actually recording yeah. Heroes later today. today. Jedi Council is going to be here uh, on the channel as well. We got uh, Christian coming in tomorrow. We're going to be re recording that. And yes, to your specific question, Mailbag, Mailbag will be returning on Saturdays and Sundays. Haven't quite decided if we're going to do it for this Saturday and Sunday because Comic-Con is going on. Going to try to get something uh, up there if we can. Uh, but yes, so those shows will all be continuing and Mailbag will be returning. Thank you so much for asking. 
All right, Kaylee Lee writes, how do you see the World of Warcraft game affecting the eventual success or failure of the Warcraft movie? At its peak, WOW had about 12 million players and Blizzard Entertainment had a great deal of goodwill from the larger gaming community, but they've been having an undeniable decline in recent years. By the time the movie releases, they may have recovered or completely fallen off a cliff. But how do you see it affecting the movie either way? I honestly see it affecting it zero, absolutely zero. The question is not what will the current popularity of World of Warcraft have towards the results of the movie. It's about how popular has it been. Because the nostalgia factor of people like me, I actually just reloaded World of Warcraft. I've been playing it again. But the nostalgia factor for people like me who six and seven years ago was literally sitting at my desk with a loaf of bread, a jar of peanut butter, and a big two-liter empty <laughs> bottle of Coke so I wouldn't have to go to the bathroom. So I would never actually have to leave my computer thing and be there for nine hours a day. <laughs> what? Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, it's, it's, you were that guy from South Park. <laughs> I kind of was. <laughs> <laughs> I've just destroyed you. <laughs> I got to get up my, my tank. Okay, so... Uh, the, the question is really about how popular was it? And it was incredibly popular. So a big resurgence right now, I don't think will have that big of a difference. A big decline right now, I don't think will have that big of a difference. It's that it has been big and huge. It will spark with a certain number of people, a nostalgia factor. They're going to be dying to see it. But here's the key thing, too. Even if it was still 12 million subscribers and people playing the game, if every single one of them went out to go see the movie, the average ticket price in America right now is about $9.10, let's round up to 10 bucks. That only means $120 or $120, 120 million at the box office. That is not enough for a movie like Warcraft. It needs to go beyond that. And I believe a movie like Warcraft being directed by the director that it's got, mm -hmm. being acted in by the actors that it's got, I, and in the genre that it's in, I believe it can be a great success combined with the nostalgia factor of the game from ages past. So I, I don't think that big of a difference right now, Mark. Yeah, the popularity of the Warcraft game right now isn't as big of a factor as it is that the Warcraft film be able to separate itself from yes. just marketing to the fans. You have to hit a wider demographic if you want the movie to do well. You need to see the movie poster and think, well, I never played Warcraft. I've heard of it. I'm intrigued to see this movie on its own legs. So I saw a trailer I really liked. I saw a clip I really liked. Really liked. I really like Duncan Jones as a director. I want to see his vision of this. I, myself, huge Magic the Gathering fan. I have a land destruction deck that'll beat the crap out of your stasis lock deck. If they made a Magic the Gathering <laughs> yeah. movie, I'd be first in line to see it. But I would worry about a Magic the Gathering film being able to cater to people outside of my realm. Okay? No pun intended. So, that's what you have to do with Warcraft. That's what they didn't do with something like Final Fantasy or like Super Mario Brothers because they, they couldn't get past the fact that it's just a video game movie. It's got to be more than just a film based on the video game it needs to stand on its own merit. Did you know that they're actually developing a, a Magic the Gathering movie? I did, but I don't want to get excited about it yeah. because I keep hearing it's in development then it gets being pushed back and it's the same fear with Warcraft. It's like, okay, well, maybe the fans of Magic the Gathering aren't what they used to be or the fervor isn't what it once was, so let's let's get this thing made. I used to have a white blue deck. Anyway. Uh, video games <laughs> expand and contract all the time. I actually played the old, old Warcraft where it was an overhead map where I'd have like yeah, some real -time of my... Yeah, real-time strategy game. Yeah, well, yeah, I'd have my... Uh, uh, you know, guys chopping wood, and then I'd also be researching death and decay so I could crisp my enemies. And That's like, where StarCraft <laughs> came from. Scar I know, StarCraft I know. just came from that. Yeah. So, I mean, I love the original Warcraft, but it helped destroy my company because <laughs> I basically linked all of uh, the people who worked for me, and we would all just chop wood and get gold and it wouldn't do jobs. And it was like, <laughs> but I was like, oh, I guess I'd better leave Chicago. It was one of the, one of the reasons. You had I was to like, leave well, a town? Yeah. <laughs> it, it dest Warcraft. Warcraft destroyed me. No, it was one of, it was one of the reasons though that I was like hey you know what I, I got a re I, I had a small animation company and all of us were playing Warcraft so I got we got to stop all of it's got to stop and I didn't play video games for like seven years after that I wonder it how literally many was stories like that are like Magic the Gathering like yeah. man I had this great black deck I was killing everything in sight then I had to leave Cincinnati <laughs> just got yeah. too intense so things just got too weird I had double headed ogres with research like blood spells and stuff and I couldn't pay rent <laughs> and like reality happened, and I was like, "You're fired. You're fired. I'm leaving." <laughs> Didn't really happen. That like internet that. bill's the I last know. thing to go. <laughs> That's the last thing. You're playing at the very end. Like no food. You're just like, ah, look, a couple more ships. I got to build two more, two more demons. Yeah. <laughs> I myself personally am lo really looking forward to Warcraft mm -hmm. for the story content, and I know a Duncan lot of Jones man. Duncan Jones, he, the Love Moon. 
I was okay with source code, but I'm really looking forward to it. I like the where, where he's coming from as far yeah. as like with the with what he said about this film. I like the look of the film, and I think it's gonna be it's gonna be way more than just playing a game. And I think they're definitely gonna hit on all the things that like current Warcraft gamers like yourself like. I sure that I'm sure that's gonna be there. Myself having only like done it like you know maybe like 15 years ago. I didn't play. I've never played it since. So I I know I know it looks cool. I've watched other people go on raids, and I'm like I feel that. That oh man, it's like then I have to leave. Like I'm you're like, Paul Newman in the no, color I know. of money. Like, really like, like, ah, I, I could, okay I could get this. in there. No, I have to stop myself. So Warcraft the movie is going to be my game. So I can't wait. All right, what's next? Harry Green writes, hey, what do you think a comedy film needs to have in order to win Best Picture? Is it a great narrative, cast, or unforgettable ending? I believe the last comedy film to get nominated was Tootsie, 1982, and to win was Annie Hall, 1977. Yeah, it's a really great question that comes up a lot about the comedies. Here's the thing. Comedies need to do just what any other film does, which is don't just do one thing great. If you're going to be an action film, that's great, but don't just do the action great. Have other things that are great as well. If you're going to be a comedy, that's great, but don't just have a lot of laughs, although that is the most important thing for a comedy, obviously. But if you want to be considered one of the great films of the year, add more than that. Now, here's the interesting thing. You mentioned that Tootsie was the last one to be nominated, which is a... <laughs> if you haven't seen Tootsie, by the way... Watch Tootsie. It stands up. It's hysterical. It totally stands up. That movie's hilarious. But here's the thing. Tootsie was more than just funny. It was actually a really interesting movie when you look at what the issues was it was addressing. I would contend that other comedies have been nominated for Best Picture. Uh, Lost in Translation. I kind of consider a comedy. Toy Story 3. I consider a comedy. But here's the funny thing that it brings up. It seems like when comedies do other things really well and have other very strong elements, we stop considering them comedies. Like, like people look at Toy Story 3, we don't consider it com- at, at its heart, in the core of its DNA, Toy Story 3 is a, is a comedy. I still contend, when you look at the core DNA of Lost in Translation, although some of it's very subtle and some of it is very is done in really, really clever ways, it is at its core is a comedy with a lot of other great quality stuff built around us, and then all of a sudden we disqualify it as the comedy. Mm-hmm. So how can we expect the Academy to like nominate comedy films, which I contend they have, when we as audience members like almost disqualify comedies when they become great films overall. So that's really more of a commentary on us in the Academy. I don't know. Mark, as a comedian, how do you see that? I mean, I, I think that, yeah, like Four Weddings and a Funeral, I believe, was nominated as well, and that was primarily considered a comedy, too. The biggest thing you need, oh, you need a great narrative, and it needs to do other things than just comedy. <laughs> Unfortunately, the biggest thing you need is a great PR push from whatever studio released <laughs> the film, because it's a very different landscape than it was when in 1977 or 1982. You need a company to say, hey, we made this movie, we really believe in it, we're going to to push it so look at a movie like something as far back as like Bowfinger or something like Juno which are which are great films they do a lot of things they're really funny but they also have heart to them you you can do it but you need a studio push in order to accomplish that now I was watching The Nutty Professor last night and while that would never get nominated <laughs> for best picture and it shouldn't there is no reason on earth you cannot tell me that Eddie Murphy did not turn in the best comedic performance and probably the best actor performance or whatever year that movie came out. He's phenomenal in it, but you're just not going to get that recognition until you have a studio backing you to put you on all the billboards and say, hey, consider this. Right. I, I'm glad you mentioned Bowfinger. That's one of my all-time favorite yeah. comedies that still did got no recognition. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's like, I always like, hey, if you haven't seen that, that's one of those missed gems. Um, Young so Frankenstein. Great. There's so many films that are incredible movies that are comedies that were not nominated, didn't win Oscars. Um, why? It's the same reason science fiction films and fantasy films and horror films never get nominated for the most part in Oscar territory. There, it's just genre pictures don't work unless what you said, they have to have this extra flavor where they get taken out of the genre and looked at in a different light that they can actually be nominated. So, I mean, that's my bone of contention with the Academy Awards, but I don't really have that because there's all these other awards shows now that deal with specifically with science fiction or fantasy. There's not really one for comedy, though. There's right. one there for used the- to be. Remember that they had the comedy awards yeah. for a while. I don't know what happened to that. Yeah, those. they have a few different award shows for, for comedy in general, but I, like, I don't lose sleep over the fact that comedies don't get nominated enough for Oscars right. or anything like that. Right. They should, but there's just something that's so subjective about comedy where if you have uh, Julianne Moore and she's slowly losing her memory to Alzheimer's, you can watch that film and say, man, that's really sad. We collectively, as a group of people, can say, man, this is really depressing. This is dramatic. But then you put on something like 22 Jump Street or Ted 2. Some people are going to find that hysterical. 
hysterical. Other people are going to say, "What this? It's a talking bear. That's the that's the movie." Okay, so we don't get it, and we're not going to go see this movie. Right. Or if you were laughing at the Julianne Moore one, you've got problems. <laughs> like, <laughs> it's so funny that she's forgetting things. <laughs> she's so comedy's forgetful. amazing. Yeah. <laughs> All right, folks, that'll do it for this uh, inaugural installment of Collider T Movie Talk. Thank you so much for joining us. Listen, don't forget, lots of great films are playing at AMC Theaters right now. Head on over to www.amctheaters.com for all of your theater showtime and, of course, your movie ticket information. If you want a, uh, if you want to subscribe to our YouTube channel, look in the description of the video, see the subscribe button, click on it, become a part of us, and don't forget, once again, you can email us at collidervideo at gmail.com. I want to thank the guy sitting at the table with me. First of all, sitting to my left, Mr. John Schnepp. Schnepp, where can people find you online? And tell us again where your booth is at Comic-Con. Well, you guys can find me at, on Twitter and uh, Instagram just at John Schnepp and at TDOSLWH. You can find me at San Diego Comic-Con this weekend at booth 3915. And right now, I just put the first 10 minutes of my feature film documentary, The Death of Superman Lives, What Happened. It's online. Just go to uh, YouTube, uh, Schnepp Zone, my channel, and you can watch the first 10 minutes of the entire film. And then, you know, then it's up to you. You could pre-order it, buy it, or meet me, and I'll sign a copy for you at San Diego Comic-Con. Of course, sitting over here, Mr. Mark Ellis. Mark, where can people find you? You can also find me in San Diego this week, and I'll be hunkered down in Hall H for a lot of it, so make sure you follow me on Twitter at 5150Ls for all the latest updates. I will be on the Masters of the Web panel Friday morning yeah. at 1130 at room... 5AB. 5AB, and I'm kicking off my Comic-Con experience Wednesday night in San Diego at the Comedy Store in La Jolla. The show's at 8 p.m. Come on out. Enjoy some yucks. Our lovely host today, Miss Ashley Mova. Ashley, where can people find you? On Twitter and on Instagram at Ashley Mova. Happy Monday, guys. <laughs> and you know what? Thought, why have they not moved Hall H into Petco Park? So people don't have to line really? up for, four, for 48 hours That's to get in. That's a great idea. You put up the giant screen. You can fit as many people as you can in there. I've never understood why they don't do that. million dollar idea, and I we're know. only on day one of Collider. <laughs> anyway, you guys can follow me on all the various <laughs> social media networks, just on Twitter and on Facebook, wherever, just at John Campia. That'll do it for us, guys. Thank you for joining us for Collider Movie Talk. My name's John Campia, and until tomorrow, bye-bye.